The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have an article here from California. Many schools are sending notes home to parents telling them that they are fat. Lauren Schmidt, a registered dietitian, starts the school year by checking out the weight of hundreds of preschoolers in the San Fernando Valley. Quote, we look at growth charts and percentiles, and when a child is at 95% of their, we can look at weight for age or weight for height. That child would be considered obese, she said. By October, CBS 2's Sirara Fadel reported that parents will get what is called healthy or unhealthy letters. Kids call them fat letters. Schmidt said out of the 900 two to five year old children she looks at, roughly 200 are listed as obese. We let the parents know in a gentle fashion, but we also send out a ton of handouts to try to help the family, she said. Experts said 19 states around the country are cracking down on childhood obesity with similar letters. Every year, there are a few phone calls from parents who are upset, said Schmidt. Many districts in Southern California, such as Riverside County, choose to follow state guidelines and instead send test results of the child's body mass index to their parents. It shouldn't be a stigma. It's not a way to categorize someone. It's just showing that this child has increased risk to be obese as an adult, which then could lead to quite a few chronic diseases, said Schmidt. The dietitian said the goal is to empower and educate parents with the tools to make healthier lifestyle choices for their children. Since when was school a health clinic? We're losing our freedoms. You go to school to learn to read, to write, to do arithmetic. You don't go to school to be called fat. That's common courtesy. But now teachers are calling students fat. It's no one's business what they eat, how much they eat, how much their parents give them, what they have to drink, or anything else. They shouldn't even be allowed to put them on a scale. There goes your freedom. It's going to be worse than that. This is just the first to come. Before long, it's going to be your weight as an adult. You'll be getting letters from Uncle Sam or the insurance company, which will be Uncle Sam. We're in a terrible mess. We're about to insert ourselves into a war we don't belong. Russian warships are moving down into the Mediterranean as I speak. And uh, if any time is good for an attack from Russia, now is good. They know who Barack Hussein Obama is. Vladimir Putin is a professional. He worked as a KGB agent. He's a communist. A ruthless communist. Oh, we're in trouble up to our eyeballs. You don't even know it yet, but you will. But we're already losing our freedom. If I ever get a letter like that, you better believe someone's going to get a piece of my mind. Where's our freedom? 
well, that's the principles of human freedom. And we're still studying human freedom and spiritual freedom. Freedom is the status of human volition as the cause of human function. Live and let live is the principle of freedom. To live and let live. Most believers don't follow this principle anymore. And that becomes a double type sword and we'll note that in a moment. Freedom is exemption from necessity apart from human consent. Freedom is self-fulfillment. Freedom is exemption from arbitrary control and exploitation. Arbitrary control body mass index. Freedom is related to privacy, property, and authority. Freedom emphasizes the need for the laws of divine establishment. They will define the legitimate authority that is designed for the purpose of protecting freedom. We've moved away from that. We're no longer electing servants, we're electing rulers. The second concept that comes from the volition in our soul is privacy. And that's privacy for believer and unbeliever. Privacy is the environment for the establishment of freedom. Without privacy there's no freedom. And freedom always demands that individuals under it have privacy. Now for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ there's additional privacy. We have a double privacy. Why? The priesthood. 1 Peter 2 5 and 2 9 as we studied before. We are a royal priesthood. As such privacy becomes part of the royal family honor code. When privacy is violated you have violated privacy double time when it comes to the believer. Freedom includes the right to possess, enjoy, benefit, or to make profit from the acquired things of this life. That is the true concept of property. Property today is looked at as something that the government can just take away without recompense. Property is defined as the sum total of one's possessions. That's why any type of property tax is evil you possess it but if it's taxed you don't possess it any longer the government does because if you don't t pay the tax they take your property it's an evil and it's the sum total of your possessions whether they be tangible or intangible such as uh, certain rights related to copyright under freedom the individual has a right to make a profit. He has a right to possess personal and real property. Ownership means any valuable right or interest which can be considered as a source of wealth. Why are we losing wealth in this country? Because we've lost the idea of the importance of property. Freedom includes authority. I heard on the internet some guy talking about how he would like there to be anarchy. He was using the wrong vocabulary. He was really off base in terms of the vocabulary. He was talking more like a libertarian. But freedom must have authority. You can't live under anarchy. Uh, that is a tyranny in itself, a, an antithetical to tyranny, but it ends up uh, people just doing what they want. That's a tyranny in itself. We do have the concept of authority under the laws of divine establishment. That includes your volition, marriage, family, and nationalism or government. Uh, you have authority, for example, over your own volition. The husband has the authority in marriage. The mother and father or with whomever the child lives is in authority over the child and that makes up the family. And then nationalism, uh, those in government, law enforcement, etc. 
they have the authority over the populace. So here's the great principle that Colonel Thiem brought out. Authority without freedom is tyranny. Freedom without authority is anarchy. Both are horrid. We must have the rule of law, and it is best if it's under the laws of divine establishment. Under the laws of divine establishment, both freedom and authority are mated can't have one without the other. You must have the rule of law, and that rule of law must extend to every citizen, from the street sweeper to the president. Freedom without the authority of doctrine is antinomianism. Now we can bring it into the spiritual life. Freedom without the authority of doctrine is antinomianism. That might be your trend, or it may not be. But authority without the freedom of the royal priesthood is legalism. That's when you become a nosy busybody. You do not respect the royal priesthood, nor do you function under the royal family honor code. You want to be an authority, and so you intrude on one's privacy, or you tell one what to do under the concept of control or power lust. And if you're not controlling someone, you become dissatisfied, disturbed, unhappy. But that's the concept of authority without freedom of the royal priesthood, and that's legalism. Both will end up in the destruction of the spiritual life without rebound. Both life and property are sacred under the laws of divine establishment. The laws of divine establishment recognize the sacredness of property, privacy, and life. Human volition cannot exist or be effective, or human freedom cannot exist or be effective, apart from human responsibility. If society becomes irresponsible, they have wasted their freedom, for freedom demands responsibility. And the freedom of a nation is no more effective than the morality, the virtue, the integrity, the sense of responsibility of all its citizens. We've lost out on our moral values as it would go with for both believer and unbeliever. We've lost out on virtue and integrity and uh, a lot of people have lost their sense of responsibility that's demonstrated by all of the fathers who are deadbeat dads they have no responsibility or no concept of responsibility freedom and authority must coexist on the basis of integrity the virtue and values attained by a nation in any given generation of history the values being passed down to this generation, my generation and younger, being passed down from even the older generation, uh, these values are not values at all. A lot of them are false values of pseudo-compassion, pseudo-tolerance, but it is tolerance of that which is evil and intolerance toward that which is good, which would be divine establishment principle. There are two enemies, humanly speaking, of freedom to the national entity. First we'll talk about is criminality. That's the internal attack on freedom. And when criminality reaches the highest offices in the land, then we have the internal enemy taking over. Law enforcement is the part of establishment designed to apprehend and punish criminals. Once that person is convicted of a crime, they have no rights under the scriptural view of law until they've served out their sentence. Capital punishment is authorized by the Word of God, and it is by far the greatest control of criminality when it is properly exercised. There are passages from the Old Testament, Genesis 9, 5 through 6, 
passages from the New Testament, Romans 13, 3 through 4, that mention the fact that the criminal should be executed. Our Lord himself even said, if you live by the sword, you shall die by the sword, meaning dying at the hands of law enforcement or after you've been sentenced. The external enemy to freedom are other nations. And there are two general categories of nations. Those that are power oriented and function under tyranny and those nations that are freedom oriented and function under the laws of divine establishment. Since we have moved and are moving from the third to fourth cycle this country is less and less freedom oriented and more and more tyranny oriented as illustrated by the fat letter the teachers are sending home. It's none of their business. They're snooping into the privacy of the family, putting their nose where it does not belong. It's wretched. And like I said, it's going to go from the preschooler to you and me. We're going to be told what to eat and how to eat, and if we don't eat a certain way, and if we don't abstain from certain things, we will not receive health care. After all, the government's paying for it, and you are an expense to society, they will say. But that's a lie. You could quickly counter, if all of this stuff's going to kill me off earlier, then I won't be using the emergency room in my late age. I will go to the doctor actually less often because I'll be dead a lot sooner. But they don't listen to argument because it's all about power. And a lot of people will say, oh, this is great. This is good. It is human good and it is evil and it in infringes upon your freedom and my freedom. We've never been at this point in our history before. Never. Never. We're destroying ourselves from the inside already. Now all it's going to take is an attack from another country and they'll just be able to push us right over. We're already soft. We, don't even, we wouldn't even know what we're fighting for once our freedom's gone. What are you fighting for? The greatest of a nation can only be measured by the virtue of its freedom or excuse me, the greatness of a nation, can only be measured by the virtue of its freedom and the integrity of its authority. Psalms 119.45, as we've studied, And I will seek freedom, for I seek your doctrines, O God. John 8.32, And you shall know the doctrine, and the doctrine, truth, shall make you free. Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore keep standing fast and do not become entangled again in the yoke of slavery. In this context, speaking to Christians, it refers to the slavery of the arrogant skills, the slavery to legalism, the slavery to any type of activism or crusader arrogance, and even uh, the slavery to the dictates of the old sin nature, whichever trend you have. Galatians 5.1 is specifically dealing with legalism, but each trend has a slavery to it. Under antinomianism and your frantic search for happiness, you're enslaved to something. Drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever. Freedom and equality cannot exist. We've studied that. And I've told you how the only time freedom and equality can exist is in God's plan. But humanly speaking, freedom and equality cannot exist. Any attempt to make mankind equal in terms of income and possessions is a part of socialism and it destroys an economy. And that's easy to understand if you were to simply put it this way. Let's say everyone tonight won 100 million dollars in the lottery. Everyone in the whole country. Tomorrow when you go to Walmart no one would be at work. Why? They all have 100 million dollars. When you go to get your hamburger, nobody will be flipping it. Why? Everybody has a hundred million dollars. You even go to the fanciest restaurant they have. Nobody there. Everybody has their one hundred million dollars. Everyone equally has 
100 million dollars and everyone equally has nothing and that concept holds true for any amount of money if everyone makes 30,000 and whatever they do it completely destroys the economy there's no motivation take you five hours at a fast food place and when people who use their mind make the same as people who use their brawn then that just totally disrupts the entire system of capitalism and it causes the intellectual class all the intellectualism of the country will be gone everyone will be walking around like a dumb robot nobody will want to work or do their job because they all make the same they can't go ahead they can't go backwards I have a friend from who came from communist China back before they started the reforms of capitalism in some ways but really they're still communist but in some areas under their reform they've had a tremendous explosion of wealth utilizing capitalism but he didn't come out of that era he came out of China before these reforms really went into place and started to make a difference and he told me you could go to the grocery store government run of course and if they're going real slow and you protest they'll simply give you the finger as it were why they have perfect job security they can't get fired so they just talk and laugh and if you need your eggs on top instead of on bottom too bad so sad that's the way they're gonna do it and the grocery bagger is just as high on the chain as the doctor and the truck driver he told me was really one of the uh, things that they looked up to because it was a dangerous job due to the roads they have there but he made the same so under communism everybody was looking up to the truck driver because he had a challenge of driving up a dirt road that has a steep incline and 5,000 feet straight down but nobody looked at anybody as in terms of you're going to get ahead in life etc so everybody made the same everybody had job security as it were and when China realized they were about to fall apart and have a revolution of their own remember Tiananmen Square shortly after Tiananmen Square they knew they had to do something or they would end up just like Russia so they quickly implemented capitalistic reforms ever since their economy has been growing at about an average of 10 percent a year so fast that they're catching up with us in terms of total economic output but they should be they have a billion people over over a billion people 1.3 billion a billion more people than we have So again, the two enemies are the criminal and, of course, the national entities that are power-oriented toward tyranny, and they wish to take our freedom. But we've so destroyed ourselves, when the fifth cycle comes, they'll just knock us right over. Freedom can e neither guarantee nor manufacture equality in the human race. Some use freedom to advance under the principle of self-determination. Others use, use their freedom to retrogress, to end up in a, some type of penal institution. And as a matter of fact, there's going to be no equality in heaven for all eternity. So that gives you an idea of what God thinks of equality. It's not important. In fact, there are going to be winners and losers in heaven. There will be those who will rule in the millennium over one, two, ten cities, a hundred cities, rule over a special city, rule in Israel with our Lord. 
And then there will be others just walking around in, as it were, a naked resurrection body. Don't take that literally. But they will be there with no reward, no city, no nothing, except eternal life. They'll be happy with that, and that's all they'll have. And for all eternity, there will be that distinction. So it comes to mind the importance of living your life in the light of eternity terms of your spiritual life to stop dwelling on those things that are temporal of course we have to since we live in the world but not of the world but we do live in the world we have to function under a temporary status this is where we are now we have to work etc do whatever modus operandi we have in life but at the same time we can think about eternity and eternity is an awfully long time. We might spend all of our time thinking about the wealth we could accumulate on this earth. And it's possible even still today in this country, at least today, to accumulate some wealth somehow through your smarts, by doing something. And that's fine. But if that accumulation of wealth is on your mind so much that it interferes with your study of the Word of God, that it interferes with you rebounding when necessary, that it interferes with your relationship, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, then you've latched on to what is temporal, and you've exchanged your et eternal inheritance for a mess of pottage. And if you end up with a hundred million dollars, you have one big mess of pottage, and that's it. Because in eternity, well, you don't take that hundred million with you. Even if they were to be stupid enough to dump it in your grave, it's not with you. It's with your rotting body, and the money, too, will be eaten up. That's temporary. And there's nothing wrong, again. I don't want you to get the idea you shouldn't try to gain some type of wealth or, and I'm not even saying it's not fun to gain wealth. It's absolutely fun to watch money make money. It's one of the fascinating things about capitalism. Not only fascinating, but very fun. And you could become very wealthy and at the same time execute your spiritual life, but it's rare because few people pass the prosperity test, but it happens occasionally. So if you aspire to be wealthy, that's fine, as long as it does not get in the way of Bible doctrine, as long as you can retain your integrity, as long as you can retain the idea and the concept of living your life in the light of eternity because that wealth becomes meaningless when you gauge it against five trillion years. You might have that wealth, you might uh, become wealthy at 40 and have that wealth until you die at 80. You, ha you were wealthy for 40 years, big deal. Or you might uh, get even as wealthy as Solomon, though doubtful, but one thing Solomon didn't have was an airplane, I'll tell you that. We can have airplanes. That's something I'd like to have. If I had enough money, I would have myself an airplane or two. Or even a Cirrus jet made by Cessna. One of those small... Excuse me. The microphone fell. It got excited listening about uh, the new airplane we're going to get. But all of that's temporary. And you need to live your life in the light of eternity because when the Lord comes in the air, and we meet him in the air in the clouds, will we be ashamed at his coming? Will we, will we be ashamed as we go through the evaluation throne If all you did your whole life was worry and toil about money, 
So if you have a lot of money, you worry about keeping it. If you don't, you worry about uh, acquiring it. That's the human standard. The spiritual standard is to be ye content with what you have. If you can be content, whether rich or poor, sometimes it's much more difficult to be content when you're rich than it is to be poor because a lot of other problems can come into play, especially if you're a, well, any type man. Uh, all the women want money. So suddenly a 70-year-old man becomes attractive to a silly 20-year-old and of course a silly 20 year old is attractive to a 70 year old man any woman to a 70 year old man becomes attractive just about and so they have problems in relationships as a result of their money or they have problems with their relatives because they all think that because they have money and they worked hard to get it that somehow the relatives who did nothing should have a piece of it and even if you gave them a piece of it, they would resent you for it. You can't buy love. You might as well get that out of your brain if it's in it. Just I'm not speaking to anyone in particular. Unless it steps on your toes. And yes, I'm speaking to you in particular, but I don't know. Can't buy love. And if you win the lottery and you give it away, which is fine, it's whatever you want to do with it. I know what I would do with it. I would give a lot to T&P give a lot to my own ministry and uh, you know some some things to some loved ones but I won't expect them to think highly of me because of it I would expect them to curse me and say why couldn't he give me more that's how people are they'll say I know how much he won in the lottery why couldn't he have given me more and they can't be content with what they have when you didn't have to give them a dime so wealth and having money has its own problems attached with it. While the pauper won't have those same problems in relationship. As it says in Proverbs, it's better to eat beans or hash with, with people you love than to eat filet mignon with uh, some Chateaubriand to drink with it with uh, people who despise you. So we have to keep in mind always the concept of living your life in the light of eternity because we do have a spiritual freedom and if you use that freedom without throwing it away without turning to a, your mess of pottage you will have eternal rewards that last forever and ever and ever and ever. And for those who do not make it, they'll be able to walk through the hall of records and see put on escrow for them what they could have had. But this isn't your motivation, not the rewards. You'll receive them in order to glorify Christ. Your motivation should be pure, and your pure motivation comes from your love for God and reciprocity. So freedom is a reality in human terms, but equality is a myth. For the function of freedom guarantees inequality. Equality is a device used by the arrogant and the disoriented person. And force equality is not only the policy of tyrants, but it is the basis for Satan's eschatological, cosmic, diabolicus. In other words, if you believe in redistribution of wealth, if you believe in socialism, if you're all right with all the things that are going on in this country today, you're under the cosmic system. In fact, under cosmic too. You've become an enemy of Christ even as a believer. That's mentioned in 1 John. One day we'll study the fact that in the church age the enemy of Christ or the enemies of Christ are actually believers so forced equality is the policy of tyrants so which tyrant do you want K 
KGB Putin or what we have now? We might find out. I know which one is worse because of the fifth cycle and what happens. You'll be raped by a lot of drunk men, women. Freedom is the policy of God and the creation of the human race to resolve the angelic conflict. Freedom. The angels had freedom as I told you. We have freedom. And freedom is what's going to resolve the angelic conflict. So every time you insert yourself into someone's life by violating their privacy, by trying to manipulate them through guilt, you are infringing upon the, out, the angelic conflict or trying to infringe upon it, and you will be squashed. Freedom should be dogmatic and inflexible about the essentials of life. Once again, principle. Freedom should be dogmatic and inflexible about the essentials of life. What are the essentials of life? Number one, Bible doctrine. You should be dogmatic and inflexible when it comes to the Word of God circulating in your stream of consciousness. You shouldn't miss a day. You should listen. But you should be flexible and pliable about the non-essentials, that is the petty things of life. It's very easy to spot a believer who doesn't care for doctrine because they have no flexibility or pliability when it comes to the petty things of life. In fact, they are petty themselves. The non-essentials become the most important thing when they're not essential at all. They're things that you might have to do as part of our modus operandi in the world but you are to be flexible and pliable. That's part of being grace-oriented as well toward people. But you are to be dogmatic and inflexible when it comes to the essentials of life, i.e. Bible doctrine. And too many pastors have become flexible when it comes to Bible doctrine. And they've become inflexible about the non-essentials. So freedom, as far as the human race is concerned, freedom means, understanding freedom means that you have common sense and orientation to reality. The only way freedom is, can exist is f that freedom must have content of thought. And when it comes to the spiritual life, that content of thought is related to the Word of God, Bible doctrine. So there are two kinds of freedom. There's the establishment freedom, and spiritual freedom. The first freedom is human and that's temporal. It's first for us anyway. And that's temporal. And that's part of establishment freedom. Establishment freedom is the heritage of physical birth beginning with the imputation of human life at birth to the soul. And when God imputes human life to the soul in Adam's original sin to the old sin nature he provides human freedom at the same time, that is, through volition. That doesn't mean your child has freedom. He's under your tyranny. But you should not really be a tyrant. That's not what I mean. It means that he has no right to freedom, he or she. And you must train them to have an appreciation for the authority that goes along with freedom. The rule of law, which for them will be your laws. All members of the human race are not born free, as it were, uh, but uh, once they grow up in life, once you become an adult, then uh, you move into freedom, but you will not move into equality. All people are born free in the sense that they are all born with volition, but of course we know a baby is not free, neither is a four-year-old, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a twelve-year-old. But once the time, by the time they become a teenager, if you haven't corrected them, it's too late. So under the principle of freedom, slavery is wrong. One of the things that has haunted this nation all the way through its history is the fact that we participated in the social evil of slavery and it's wrong. 
Mankind was created by God. He was placed on this earth. And we are here to resolve the angelic conflict. As a result, we have freedom. We have establishment and its protection, at least during the times when we are functioning as a client nation to God. We're losing that now. So, what does mankind have in common with the angels? Are we equal with the angels? No, not yet. In fact, we'll be above the angels at the resurrection. Right now, we're way beneath the angels. Positionally, we're above the angels, but we don't realize it until the resurrection. So we're not equal with angels. We can't zoom around at greater than light speed and go to and fro, and we don't have their intelligence, their frame of reference, or anything like that. The only thing we have in common with the angels, and even with the fallen angels, is volition. So God has delegated establishment authority for us uh, so that uh, we can be trained in our youth or if you're a parent so that you can prepare your child for life. Parents who don't know how to raise their children are dumb. A parent who can't keep a preschooler in line has no life skills. God forbid if they ever get in a position of management. They have no life skills. You let a four-year-old run all over you, or a three-year-old, or any type preschooler, or even if they're in school, and you let them run over you, well, you're destroying their life, and yours is already destroyed. But again, they have a chance to get with the Word of God after they get beat up enough through their teenage years and into their early life. They'll have a lot of garbage to cycle out because the parent did not love that child enough to punish that child. Spare the rod, spoil the child. And if you spare the rod, you are not showing proper love toward your child. In fact, you're treating that child as if it's not yours, as if it's illegitimate. Our Lord punishes us. In fact, he scourges us alive with a whip. Why? Because we're his children. One thing I will, that is hard for me to understand, I do understand it, it's called arrogance. But one thing that is very difficult for me to understand is for those who have children, for them to think that they can lose their eternal life. First of all, that's dumb on the surface. That which is eternal is eternal in nature. You can't cut short eternity, so how can you cut short eternal life which has been given to you? You can't cut short eternity no more than you can cut short God. That's easy enough to understand. They don't get it. And then they have children. And they raise their children as they see fit through discipline, etc. And they would probably tell you they love all their children. And they would probably lie and say they love, if they have multiple children, they would lie to you and say they love each of their children the same. But, they do have a love for the child, and it's their child, and you don't see them throwing the child away if you have normal affection. And yet these religious types, who can show love for their children and understand uh, the love that a parent has for a child, can think that God will somehow be disappointed in us, so much so that when we fail, or fail at what they think is failure, which is usually a false standard. They think that God just gets rid of us. Oh, really? The first time your child messed up, when they were a, a preschooler, you just tossed them out in the snow, didn't you? 
Well, that's what you think God does. You think God, as soon as you mess up, He's just going to toss you away. Then you're going to have to beg your way back into the house. That's ridiculous. If you can function in your natural affection as a human being, with love toward your child, then how in the world could you ever think that God does not have a greater love for His children? You dolt. You moron. You ignorant, arrogant fool. How stupid could you be? Maybe you don't love your children. Maybe that is your problem. Maybe you don't have natural affection. You're so arrogant, you would kick your child out in the snow when he makes a mistake. Or you would act disappointed, etc. Well, you haven't reached any type of spiritual maturity if you're disappointed in anyone. God's not disappointed in anything. If God were disappointed in what the human race does, or e even with what Christians do, well, he would be one sad God. But God's happy. It's not sad. He knew every sin you would commit before you commit it. He loves you still. He might skin you alive with a whip, but that's just a demonstration of his love, just as when you spank your children hard enough to where it hurts, then you are demonstrating love. And if you don't spank your child hard enough to where it hurts, then you are de demonstrating a lack of capacity for love and you are demonstrating selfishness and you are demonstrating a lack of orientation to life and you failed. And it will show. People will mock you and make fun of you because they will say it's your responsibility and they would be right. Ah, oh, what a disaster it is in this country that people don't have enough sense to know how to discipline their own children and what another tragic disaster that believers can't understand eternal security that's the most simple doctrine in the world to understand that shows you that experience teaches you nothing the experience of you having a child and loving that child taught you nothing if you already have the doctrine, well, you can get principles out of it. For I can definitely understand if I can love my son as much as I love my son, then how much more does God love me as his child? And I never go around with the guilt complex, and I never go around thinking that I've disappointed God because you can't, and you say, my. You are just encouraging everyone to be a sinner. It takes no encouragement. I've never met anyone who needed encouragement to sin. 1 John 1 9 is a license to live your spiritual life. Those of you who are thinking in terms of being encouraged to sin, well, you're already in sin. You're arrogant and you don't even know it. You're blinded to it. You're so blind that you can't understand the most basic of Bible doctrine. Actually, you've gone backward from the point of your salvation. Because at salvation, you understood for a bit that you were eternally secure. Later on, you went backwards into reversionism and picked up on the idea that you had to work for salvation. You went back to your unbelieving ways. That's what unbelievers do. They work for salvation. They try to impress God, but they cannot get over that wall of separation between God and man because their righteous deeds are as minstrel rags corrected translation of Isaiah 64 6 so God has delegated establishment authority so that you can prepare for life so that you can be taught and these establishment principles act as an agent for the principles of business, marriage, family, team, city, nation. Freedom cannot exist without authority. Again, authority without freedom is tyranny, and freedom without authority is anarchy. Both tyranny and anarchy destroy human freedom. 
So this temporal human freedom is designed for the entire human race, believer and unbeliever, under the laws of divine establishment. It's based on the function of human volition. It's based on the sacredness of privacy, property, and life. Privacy is the environment of human freedom. The only people who have no right to privacy are, of course, young children and criminals. They have no privacy or right to privacy. And, of course, those serving in the military, they give up their privacy. Property is the expression of freedom. The very fact that you own anything is indicative of the fact that you live in an environment of freedom. The very fact that you own a car, the very fact that you own a house, the very fact that you have a job, the very fact that you have uh, the law of the speed limit, the very fact that you have a red light, which is a rule of law, all of that indicates that you have freedom. But when the government comes and starts taking away your property and starts to have confiscatory tax rates that are so high that you cannot become successful, then you live in a poor society and one that has no freedom. Believe you me, we live in a time that the insecure politicians will use a crisis in order to steal your freedom and your income and your property. If we were to have a major world war, the first thing they would probably try to do, which would be the stupidest thing, I know what would happen under current authority. They would say, turn in your guns. Our military needs the uh, guns and the munition. Because, yeah, right. If they're going that far, we've lost. We might as well keep our guns and shoot the enemy on our own shore. That'll be the first thing they'll go for. They'll go for all types of things. The manufacturing of some type of crisis is oftentimes how Laws that otherwise wouldn't be passed get passed because it works on the emotions and not the thinking of the people. You can't let a crisis go to waste. That's what's been said. Believe you me, they will not. And our country's in crisis and they don't really have to manufacture it. So property is the right to possess, to acquire, to benefit, to make profit and from acquired things in life. Property is defined as anything subject to ownership. Ownership is the manifestation of human freedom. Ownership in the broad sense is any viable right or interest which may be considered a, as a source of wealth, whether that be property, whether that be money that you have, or a business, or um, anything that you own. Life as well as property is of course sacred. We have to have life in order to exercise and function under the principle of freedom. So the laws of divine establishment as found in Romans 13, 1 through 10 recognize the sacredness of privacy, property, and life as the means of functioning under this temporal freedom. And those who violate these sacred rights are criminals. And criminals have no right to privacy, property, or even life, or even life that is, uh, through capital punishment under certain conditions such as rape, murder, etc. Human freedom cannot exist or be effective apart from human responsibility, as we have noted. Well, we will continue tomorrow night in our study of freedom, and we will continue with our study of human freedom and move on from there to our most fantastic and phenomenal spiritual freedom. That freedom you have to get with the spiritual life and become a member of the pivot and turn this country around, or the freedom to throw it all away for a mess of pottage and to be ashamed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege, freedom, opportunity of studying freedom. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us concerning what we've noted. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.